Um, hello, good morning. Thank you very much for coming out and uh, joining Transition 2015. Uh, as Noah was saying, I take this very long-term perspective in, in my work as an economist. I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford, came over here to New York for the conference. Um, and back in Oxford, my research is mostly focused on um, income growth over the very long run and the distribution of incomes and also of wealth. Um, and in this talk, I think I mostly connect to the first of these um, core topics that um, James was mentioning before. And we'll talk about um, the very long-term uh, growth of incomes around the world, the decline of poverty. And I will also try to connect it to the second um, of these um, core uh, themes, um, to, to the theme of connecting people. So that's kind of the overview of, of what you uh, should be expecting. Um, I want to start with something um, basic um, and quickly sit, talk about how incomes actually grow. The basic um, reason why incomes grow is that productivity increases. To give a concrete example, um, I want to talk about the productivity increases in book production. Before the invention of the printing press, the printing press was um, invented in the early 15th century, around 1440, actually back home, kind of very close to, to where I'm from in, in Germany, in Mainz, by Johannes Gutenberg. Before, before Gutenberg came along, um, the only way of copying a text was uh, to sit down and, and write the whole thing down, to take one book and, um, and copy the whole, uh, the whole text, and these scribes, uh, we're able to do 3,000 words per day, roughly. These are the estimates that I found in um, the history uh, books. Um, that means for a book like the Bible, it takes you 136 days to uh, copy one book, or 0 0.007 books per day. And then Gutenberg comes along and turns a wine press into a printing press in the second um, slide here, or in the second section here, and productivity um, jumps up more than 300-fold. It's then possible to write two and a half books per day. And this productivity increase means that for the hour of work that you put in or the day of work that you put in, you get more out. And the other guys that are not um, in the book printing business but um, are working in, as, as farmers or the guys who um, produce your clothes, they also have productivity increases. And as everyone gets more productive, you get more for the time that you put in and you can trade it with your, with your neighbor who's in the uh, textile manufacturing industry or so. Um, and then it jumps up again. In 1818, I have the next data, data point where steam-powered printing comes in and uh, you can produce 25 books per day. And then uh, if we move to today, um, finish this long-term perspective, then we have the internet. And of course, there's um, basically no limit of how many texts you can um, copy in a day. And you can, um, you can just take it. If you want, you can take the Bible and uh, and, and copy it as often as you want in a day. Uh, so productivity is off the charts. Um, and Thoreau puts it in a very nice way and said, the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. And that's the basic, um, the basic mechanism um, behind income growth. And, and a small aside, one consequence of uh, putting less time in for, for getting more out of it is that working hours actually decreased massively. This shows you uh, the hours of work per week for a couple of uh, industrialized, early industrialized countries. And from the 19th century, you had very high um, working hours, above 60 or 70 hours per week. People had no weekends, no holidays, um, were falling um, into their beds in the, in the night and, um, and getting up to work in the morning. Um, and then it came down over the, as productivity was increasing over the um, last century, and we now have working hours between 30 or 40. You also see that the US is at the top of, um, of this distribution here. You guys apparently value work uh, much more than leisure um, than back home in, in Europe, but it's also down for you. Um, so I want to take this perspective now on a, on a global stage and look at the incomes of, of all the people around the world over these um, last 200 or so years from the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution to today. Um, the first estimates that we properly have for, for incomes around the world are from 1820. You have some earlier estimates um, for some European countries and also for some countries in the world, but they are, if you ask me, mostly made up. So for 1820, you have, um, you have the first proper data, and you see 
income levels um, here for these countries, for the gray countries we don't have data, for, for the red countries we know that income levels were very low, below $1,000 um, um, per year per person. Um, of course, these incomes, they have to be adjusted for price changes over time. Um, this is something that I will do for, for all of the um, graphs and, and data that I show in this presentation. You have to take into account that um, like if you, if you do it across countries, you have to take into account that income, um, that the $10 that you spend here in, in Manhattan doesn't get you as far as the $10 that you take uh, to India and, and spend in India because the price for, for rice or for accommodation or for transport is gonna be lower in India and you wanna, have, you wanna take this into account. And the same we do um, by taking inflation into account over time. So it's comparable with modern incomes. So for the dark red countries, we see that incomes are very low, below $1,000, and the orangey, reddy, red colors in, um, in Western Europe and also the US um, indicate that incomes have grown there a little bit, um, but still below $2,000. And, and the fact that, the, like the reason why these incomes grew um, is, is basically the industrial revolution and the rise in productivity. Um, there is, I was just saying um, how you adjust for, for prices over time, but there are also limits to that. And I think that's also important to point this out when you um, show data and look at data. Um, one, one small story is that in, in 1836, the richest man of the, of, at the time died, uh, Nathan Rothschild. Um, he's, if you look up the, the Forbes list of the richest people in the world, he's still counted as the second richest person who was ever alive. The first guy, the, the richest guy is apparently, to, according to this list, apparently um, a, a general from the times of uh, Julius Caesar. But um, the Rothschild is, is counted, uh, is, is considered richer as all of the rich guys today, as richer as, as, as I don't know, Bill Gates or, or Carlos Slim in Mexico or so. Um, but the reason why he died in 1836 um, was a simple infection after an abscess. So he died of a disease or of, a, of an injury um, that would today be easy, tre easily treatable by just going down to the pharmacy and getting some antibiotics for a few pence. So I think that's a, that's a story that shows how, how limited these comparisons really are, because all of us could afford these antibiotics and many people in the world could afford these antibiotics. At the same time, this guy Rothschild wasn't able or would never uh, board an airplane, he would never watch TV, he never listened to recorded music, he uh, didn't have the chance um, to watch a movie in the cinema. So in a lot of aspects, we are all much richer than uh, the guy who, who is considered the second richest in history by Forbes. Um, so another aspect um, to, to focus on um, instead of, 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 um, of incomes, something that is more easily comparable is health. This world map shows you estimates for life expectancy back in 1800, and we have the same picture there. Life expectancy is very low. The dark red colored countries have a life expectancy um, in, the, in the low 20s, 20 to 25 years, all shown in the modern country borders, and the lighter red colors are in the 30s, but no country in the world has a life expectancy above 40 back in 1800. And now we want to take this perspective uh, to today and look at pros pros prosperity and poverty over the long run. And um, a second way of looking at the income distribution back in 1820 um, is to look at the distribution on the x-axis, just as, as Geoffrey had before. You see a logarithmic scale from one, um, $100 on the very left all the way to $50,000 yearly income on the very right, again adjusted for price changes. And the income distribution looks like that. All of the countries and all of the people of the world are very close to, together. The inequality is low in the, um, in the world income distribution, and the bulk of the people have an income of around 500. Just a quick comparison with average incomes in 2010 in the same currency measure and uh, also the same data source adjusted for um, price changes. Um, the income of the people back in 1820 is comparable to the income of, of the people in, in Madagascar today. And Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world. Iraq today lies here, and, and India is to the very right of the income distribution in 1820. Only a tiny elite is richer than the average Indian today. And Peru, China, Chile, Japan are to the very right. And if you plot, if you add the US, then it's um, off the charts to the right. Now we make a huge jump and jump to 1988 when we, where we have much better income data 
um, and also the comparison in terms of incomes is, is, is easier to do and, and I think more sensible. Um, so we look at the income distribution a hundred and what is it, um, 68 years later. $100 on the very left, $60,000 on the very right. Um, back in 1988, you have the developed countries here. So the income, uh, the average income in the developed countries is around 9,000 and then it has this um, very long right-hand side tail um, that I cut off um, of people that are much, much richer than that and have a much higher income. If you add Sub-Saharan Africa, then you see that Sub-Saharan Africa is much poorer, lies to the very left, and there's almost no overlap between Sub-Saharan Africa and the developed countries, meaning that um, the richest people in Sub-Saharan Africa back then are as poor as the poorest people in the developed countries. Then we add the Soviet Union at the time and, and the Middle East and Northern Africa, and also with high inequality, Latin America and the Caribbean. The inequality is stretching out from the very poor in Sub-Saharan Africa all the way to the very right. Um, then much of Asia in poverty, and then the big countries, India in poverty, and China. Um, the area of each of these um, world regions or countries um, corresponds to the population size so that we can um, get an idea of the distribution of every person in the world. And these data um, are created or estimated from, from household surveys. Uh, two economists, Franco Milanovic and Christoph Lackner, who both now work here in the US, um, estimated the global income distribution based on these household surveys. Um, and for 1988, this is the first data point they, they have they find this distribution. If we just look at the distribution, then we see a world that is clearly divided between the majority of the people um, in poverty on the left, and then a small gap and this second hump on the right, the people in the developed countries that are much richer. Um, and we can also add the poverty line. The poverty line um, is, is, the, is the World Bank's um, official poverty line, most used poverty line that there is. Um, it's in a it's um, a poverty line that is used across all countries to make comparisons how poor um, the population in different countries are. And um, the ex this extreme poverty line is $1.25 per day. Um, if you sum that up over 365 days, then you get to a yearly income of $456. So it is a very low um, poverty line, but I guess a meaningful one because the, ink, the, the, the change in living conditions um, is most traumatic at the very bottom of the, of the income distribution and, and helping and, and increasing the income of uh, the poorest people in the world really makes a dramatic um, um, change for the food provision, um, the health um, um, condition, um, education possibilities um, for, for the poorest people in the world. Um, and we see if we add this line that it runs right through the middle of the um, hump of the poor people in the world and that a lot of um, people are lying to the left, um, like their incomes lies to the left of the poverty line and these are the people in extreme poverty back then. And now we can move um, this distribution forward and see how it changed over the last um, decades. In 1993, we see that the number of people, particularly at the bottom of the income distribution, rises, the world population increases. And then in 1998, we see that China and India and Asia is moving to the right, right. also Latin America is starting to grow. And the peak of these distributions li lies now to the right of the poverty line. And this continues in 2003. And then in 2008, we see China actually overtaking much of, of India, the other Asian uh, tiger economies are also moving to the right. And then in the very latest data, the distribution of the, of the world in, world's incomes has changed to, to this. So from this bimodal distribution with two big humps, we changed to a world that isn't um, divi divided into poor and, and rich anymore, and you have a unimodal distribution. This is not to say that inequality is low. The inequality in the world is very um, high, and income differences between different countries are much, much higher than any differences between people within any country. So inequality in the world is still very high, but since um, the 90s or so, the inequality in the world um, is coming down. Um, and now we want to focus just on the, at the bottom end of the distribution, 
and look at um, uh, global poverty over the very long term. And um, this connects to this theme that um, James was outlining in the, f in the beginning of the rise of the global middle class. So back in 1820, we have this unimodal distribution that we looked at before, 1988. Um, the now familiar bimodal distribution, and in 2011, uh, oh, that was German, um, <laughs> uh, this unimodal distribution that we see here to the right. And um, if we now look at the share of the world population living in absolute poverty, I was saying before that um, these comparisons with the very past are, um, are not, not easy to make, and um, in, in some meaningful ways, you are all richer than uh, the richest guy in, in 1836, so take this with um, the grain of salt. Um, but some um, estimates are saying that it's around 80, 90 um, um, percent. Um, the, a famous research paper is, is putting it down to 94 percent of the world population living in poverty, and only a small, small elite is, is slightly better off. And now, um, if we move from 80 to 1820 to 1988, we see that the rich countries are moving to the right, so poverty in the rich countries starts to fall. And that, of course, also means that um, the share of people in the world that live in poverty is falling. And in 1970, it um, comes down to around 60%. For 1988, then, we have better data. And if we look at the poverty line here with $456 per year, we can ask how much lies to the left, how much lies to the right. And it's 36% of the world population that has an income lower than 456, we can put this down to our chart and we can do the same with 2011 and ask how many people are, or what's the share of people living to the, uh, with incomes to the left of the poverty line. And it's 14% in these latest estimates. Um, and we can put it down and um, get the complete picture of um, how poverty came down over the last 200 years. So the share of people living in absolute poverty is falling from um, from around 80 or 90 percent and reaches um, um, below um, 14 percent in the very latest estimates. And the share of people not living in poverty, as I, was, like, as I titled my um, talk, Lifting the World Out of Poverty, this is, the, this is the big story over the last 200 years, that there are more and more people that are um, enjoying living conditions um, that, was, that were um, before only available for a very small elite. And we can, now we've been, also, we've been always looking at the share of people living in poverty, but we can also look at the absolute number of people in poverty. And then the picture changes to this. We see the massive increase in the world population, which is itself a consequence of the improving living conditions. Uh, back in 1820, barely, then a, barely more than a billion people lived on, around, um, on this planet. And then still in, 19, in, in 1900, um, it's, not, it's not even uh, two billion, and then a more than uh, fourfold increase over the 20th century, and we have now more than seven billion people living um, on Earth. And then in red, we see the number of people in poverty, and we see that the absolute number of people in poverty is actually increasing for the whole 19th century and for much of the 20th century. And at some point in the 1970s or 80s, the, the number um, of people in poverty starts to decline. And for the whole period, we see that the number of people out of poverty is, is increasing. Um, now we focus focused on income. If, if you are more interested in, um, in health conditions, I want to give a very quick overview on how global health changed. Oh, there's a jump there. Uh, there's a slide missing. Um, it's a bit of an unusual chart, so I got to explain it a bit. On the x-axis, we see the cumulative share of the world population. And on the y-axis, um, the, the, uh, the, the vertical axis, we see all of the countries um, ascending by their life expectancy. On the red line, back in 1800. So we see on the very right, um, the countries with the lowest life expectancy back in 1800, India, South Korea, with a life expectancy of around 25 years. And then on the red line, on the very right, we see uh, Belgium, Netherlands, and also the US as the countries with the best health back in 1800, but still with life expectancies of below 40 years. And then in orange, we see the change um, of global health that happened in the 150 years 
um, that followed. And it shows this massive increase in, in health in, in some of the rich countries. Norway on the very top and the US and Canada following. Um, and all of, like I only show a couple of countries, but it's the data um, is available for all of the countries and all of the data, all of the countries are plotted in this charts, chart. And on the very left on the orange uh, line, we see the countries that barely made any progress in, in health and still had um, life expectancies of below 40. China, India, um, countries in Africa, like Somalia, with very low um, life expectancy. And just as with income, with incomes, the world has changed dramatically over the last decades. Oh, that is too bad. <laughs> like the slide is apparently missing, but the world has changed. And what you would see if the slide was there uh, is that now the biggest gains actually went to, the, um, to those that are um, in the worst health conditions um, in 1950. And countries like India and China now have life expectancies above 60 or 70 years. And um, the, the progress for the, for the richer countries is much smaller so that the inequality in, in global health um, fell um, very dramatically over the last decades. But it's also true that some countries, particularly in Africa, still are in, in, um, in, in bad health. Sorry that this uh, slide is not showing up. So we now took, I think, three perspectives. Like we looked at income growth over the long run. We saw the um, incomes, income distribution moving to the right and global income inequality falling. We saw um, how poverty um, was falling over the very long run. And now we, 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 we were just looking at how global health was improving and inequality in global health um, also um, decreased. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd um, show one quick research paper that focuses um, very nicely on, a, on the topic of this, um, gen of this uh, conference and connects the two themes of uh, lifting uh, people out of poverty and connecting people. It's a research um, paper by, unfortunately not by me, it's, it's very clever, um, by a colleague who is here now in the US, Robert Jensen. And he studied um, fishing villages in uh, the south of India and looked at um, what happened when um, mobile phones were introduced in the region. Um, the regions that he studies all lie in the Indian state of Kerala. Kerala is here shown on the map in the uh, southwestern tip of India. You see Sri Lanka just below. And um, in Kerala, mobile phones were introduced step by step, rolled out from the south of the state all the way to the north of the state in these three regions that are roughly shown here, region one, two, and three. And economists always love that if something is rolled out step by step because it allows us to exploit the uh, variation in each country or in each region to, um, to, to study the effects of uh, this kind of natural experiment that was happening there in Kerala. Um, and before, um, and on these charts, we, we look at the three regions. We have the survey period on the x-axis, and for each region, we look at um, the uptake of uh, mobile phones by the fishermen in Kerala. And of course, before, no one had a phone, like there was no phone reception, so you would have been pretty stupid to buy one. And then <laughs> the phones were added in these three regions at different points in time, and then fishermen um, um, bought phones and around 70% of the people, uh, of the fishermen had uh, mobile phones after the introduction. Um, and the problem for the fishermen before phones were available was that, um, I'm gonna explain the chart in a bit. The problem was that the fishermen would leave early in the morning or in the night, go out um, um, on, the, on the ocean and, and um, go fishing, and in the early morning they would come back. On some days, you would be very successful. The fishermen would catch plenty of fish, and they would bring plenty of fish back to their home village. Um, so many fish, in, in fact, that um, there wasn't the demand for all of the uh, fish that they, that they caught. Um, and the result was that prices for the fish were very low, and if, um, if there were actually too many fish, then, um, then um, some of the fish were actually wasted and had to be thrown away. On the next day, you would have the fishermen going out and they were less success successful. They would come back to the village with um, much fewer fish 
and um, the demand would outstrip the supply of fish and prices would increase. And that's what you see here on these uh, three charts. On some days, you have the price of um, fish down to zero because fish were actually thrown away. On other um, days, uh, fish prices were, were higher than 10 rupees per kilo. Um, so you have this massive volatility of fish prices. And each day when it hit zero, fish were actually thrown away. And now um, they added mobile phones to the region. And, and he, like, I think it was clever because he anticipated all of that and, and, and collected the data, like sent people down there to collect the data all in advance to actually study this um, effect of the introduction of, of mobile phones. Um, what you see then is that once the f uh, mobile phones are introduced, this volatility is, is gone and you have these pretty flat um, price lines um, that you see in this, this chart. And the reason, of course, is that people, um, that the fishermen, when they're out on the sea and, and know that they catch a lot of fish, um, they coordinate with the markets in the different fishing villages and they would call up the, the guys that are in the village down south and ask how the, how the fish prices and the supply is down there and if, if it was profitable, then they would, um, would drive down south or up north. Um, so you, you suddenly um, arbitrage becomes a possibility and from this state of near autarky, um, you change to this connected market and I think it's a very nice example to show how productivity increase is at the core of um, income growth, but for productivity to actually translate into incomes, it needs much more. It needs institutions and it also needs um, um, markets that, that function properly and this um, uh, exchange of information is a, is a very crucial bit that is, I think, very nicely highlighted here. And it also highlights the importance of um, modern technology for, for markets to function properly, even in the world's um, poorest regions. Um, to summarize these results, before uh, the introduction of mobile phones, 0% of the fishermen sell outside their local market um, near outer key, just bringing the fish back to their villages. And after 30 to 40% engage in arbitrage and sell outside their local markets. And the consequences is that waste, which was between 5 and 8% before, so one fish in 12 or so, um, was actually thrown away, which is also an environmental aspect or an, an ethical aspect for, um, for animals. Um, this was completely eliminated and the fishermen's profit increased, of course, if they don't have to throw the fish away, but they can actually sell them, then of course it's also good for their income and also for consumers it was good as consumer prices actually fell. I think there's a nice paper that connects the different strands. Um, and now the, uh, like the very last bit of, of my a uh, short presentation, we'll look into the future um, for, for global poverty and the global income distribution. Um, I think for some aspects, um, pr projections into the future are, are very much possible, like global um, population f um, projections or even country projections for, for population growth um, are, have a very good track record. For incomes, it's, it's much harder, but I'll, I'll, I'll give... I'll give a quick view into the future. So we, um, we saw the uh, decline of the share of people in extreme poverty before, from around 43% in 1981, when the first World Bank data is available, down to 14% in 2011. There is also a projection, or like a, yeah, it's like a projection of the World Bank for 2015, and this, um, th this latest estimate is that it came down to 12%. And it's, um, it also shows that this number, 36%, is the share of people in poverty back in 1990, and um, the Millennium Development Goals that come to an end um, this year in 2015, um, the first of these Millennium Development Goals set by the UN and, um, uh, was to um, half the world population living in extreme poverty, and this was actually achieved from, down from from 36% in 1990 to 14 or now 12% in the world. And uh, just in the coming days, there's the big um, conference on the Sustainable Development Goals, the set of goals that will um, now be adopted by the World Bank and the United Nations for the uh, next years. And again, uh, for very good reason, poverty will, will be um, at the very uh, top of, these, of, these, of this list of goals. And um, the United Nations um, now has this very ambitious aim of ending extreme poverty 
um, until 2030. Um, we see that poverty is declining. Uh, one way of looking into the future is to, to say what happens if um, the, con con like the trend that is currently happening continues. And um, the World Bank went and um, took each country's growth experience over the last 10 years and assumed that this growth experience will continue into the future. And what you get then is um, a world poverty rate of just below 5% for 2030. So for the uh, very ambitious goal of ending extreme poverty until 2030 to, uh, to come true, we actually have to, to, to do more. And um, uh, while the direction of change is a good one, it has to actually happen faster if, this goal wants, has to, uh, want, if we want this goal to be achieved. Um, but it's still going in the right direction. And I think one quick look at, at Africa is interesting because um, it is portrayed often as still as this, consequent, as, as this continent where uh, nothing moves forward and um, people are just experiencing one, one famine and after the next civil war and, and so on. And things are actually probably changing in Africa. This shows you economic growth since the mid-90s um, until today. So it's the annual GDP growth per capita um, for all of these regions. And we see that many countries in Africa like Mozambique or Angola or Ethiopia, uh, Nigeria have very strong growth of five, six, seven, or even eight percent. Um, it also highlights the fact how, how important institutions are. Uh, Zimbabwe there with um, Mugabe still in power um, is, the, is the only country where, uh, where incomes actually fell over this period. But if this trend continues, then I think it, we, it, it could be possible that we, that we actually achieve this um, goal of the UN. One last thing that I want to mention, which makes me a bit more op bit optimistic about actually um, making this, um, achieving this goal, is to look at um, education around the world. And there, it is possible to look into the future without any fancy projections or econometrics um, by just looking at the breakdown by age group and um, studying um, the education of the young and comparing it with the old. And if we look at literacy rates, then um, this world map shows you literacy rates of the 65-year-olds um, and older around the world. And all of these uh, red and orange countries, as you see, have literacy rates of um, below 40 or 20 percent in the old age group. That is true for many countries in Africa. It is true for the Middle East and also for South, East, uh, for South Asia where um, literacy rates are low and also uh, much of Latin America and Southeast Asia um, don't have very high literacy rates. If we then um, look at the younger generation, then the world has really changed dramatically. This is the age group of the 15 to 24 year olds. We see that um, Southeast Asia and Latin America have literacy rates um, above 90% now. Um, if we look at the north of Africa and also the Middle East, then I think that's an underreported story where really um, the, the education of the young is, is much better than the education of the old generation. And that uh, we know from, from the research that it matters for um, democratization and for um, the institutions that a country has. And of course, it also matters for productivity, which then translates into income growth. And with this um, optimistic view, into the future. Um, I want to end this presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Question for Max before we go to coffee break, and that is, uh, why aren't there more optimistic economists? <laughs> uh, well, that's a difficult one. I haven't thought about that. I don't think I, I don't think economists are so very pessimistic. No. I don't know, it's like it's called the dismal science, right? It's uh, true. Um, but I think this, like, I mean, at, at least the, the fortunately growing section of economists that is doing empirical research um, looks at these kind of data every day and, and understands how these trends changed over, over the long run. And I think it also um, changed my perception. Like, I, I, I wasn't very optimistic before I started um, uh, studying economics. I was studying philosophy as an undergrad, yeah. which is, I guess, the, 
uh, the yes, most yes. pessimistic <laughs> discipline that you can. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the idea is if you want to become optimistic, you should become an economist. Yeah, or look at the data. Okay, I like that. <laughs> All right, look at the data. All right, let's thank Max again, and then let's go to coffee.